Today's lecture is on energy and ecosystems. Before the lecture even begins, make sure you've read the assigned chapter for this lecture, taken notes on that, not just highlighted, and reworded some of those key pieces of information from the text in your own words. During the lecture, minimize distractions by turning off music and listening to the lecture in a quiet space where you can focus. In order to focus at your best, be sure to turn off your phone. For each lecture, take plenty of notes. Be sure that you put these slides in your own words, allowing you to maximize your ability to retain the information. So once your phones are off, let's get started. Here's our concept map for the lecture. We're going to focus on ecosystem ecology, where we will discuss energy flow and chemical cycling through ecosystems. Recall from our first ecology lecture that an ecosystem is all organisms living in a given area and the abiotic factors with which they interact. Ecosystems can be described in part by the population and community phenomena we've already discussed. Because the ecosystems are composed of populations and communities, plus the abiotic factors. However, because of this key addition of abiotic factors, ecosystem ecologists also need to consider energy flow and chemical cycling and how these factors influence ecosystems. Because ecosystem ecologists study the interactions of organisms with the physical environment, Many ecosystem approaches are based on the laws of physics and chemistry. The first law of thermodynamics states that energy cannot be created or destroyed, but only transferred and transformed. Plants and other photosynthetic organisms convert solar energy to chemical energy, but as they do so, the total amount of energy does not change. The energy stored in organic molecules must equal the total solar energy intercepted by the plant minus the amounts reflected and dissipated as heat. The second law of thermodynamics, which states that every energy exchange increases the entropy of the universe, implies that these energy conversions are inefficient. When they occur, some energy is always lost as heat. That is precisely why energy flows through an ecosystem rather than cycles within it. Ecosystems need the continuous source of energy from the sun because of this inefficiency. Matter, like energy, cannot be created or destroyed. This is the law of the conservation of mass, which is another important law for understanding ecosystem functioning. Unlike energy, chemical elements are continually recycled within ecosystems. The figure on the slide shows an overview of energy and nutrient dynamics in an ecosystem with chemical cycling shown by blue arrows and energy flow shown by orange arrows. So now that we've talked about some of the physical laws that regulate ecosystems, Let's look at ecosystems, energy, and limiting factors. Each day, the Earth's atmosphere is bombarded with 10 to the 22nd joules of solar radiation. This is enough energy to supply the demands of an entire human population for 19 years at 2013 energy consumption levels. However, about 50% of this energy is absorbed scattered or reflected by clouds or dust in the atmosphere. The amount that reaches the surface of the earth limits the possible photosynthetic output of ecosystems. On top of that, only a small fraction of the energy that does reach the earth's surface is used in photosynthesis since much of that radiation strikes surfaces that don't photosynthesize. As a result, only 1% of that original energy, the 10 to the 22nd joules, is actually used by Earth's primary producers, which collectively create about 150 billion metric tons of organic material every year. Total primary production in an ecosystem 
is known as that ecosystem's gross primary production, GPP, and is defined as the amount of energy from light or chemicals converted to chemical energy of organic molecules. But this isn't necessarily the most useful measure of primary production for an ecosystem because not all of this production is stored as organic material in the primary producers because they use some of the molecules as fuel in their own cellular respiration. Therefore, net primary production, or MPP, is often used. MPP is GPP minus RA, where RA is the amount of energy used by the primary producers for their own cellular respiration. On average, MPP is typically about half of what GPP is for a given ecosystem. MPP is a key measurement because it represents the storage of chemical energy available to consumers within the system. Satellites are powerful tools for studying global patterns of primary production. These images, like the one on your screen, illustrate the variation in MPP across the globe. Tropical rainforests, often near the equator, are some of the most productive terrestrial ecosystems. You can spot one of them on this image as the areas with the warmest color. In contrast, open oceans are relatively unproductive ecosystems, shown in purple. The big question is why? What limits production in an ecosystem? Think about this. Light probably limits production in deep ocean ecosystems. However, if light was the most important factor limiting primary production in ocean ecosystems, we'd see a pattern of greater productivity in oceans near the equator, which receives the most intense solar radiation. But from the image on the previous slide, we see that there is no such gradient. So something else must be more important limiting factor. Nutrients appear to be an important limiting factor, nitrogen and phosphorus in particular. Additionally, in terrestrial ecosystems, temperature and moisture can influence primary production too. Warm, wet ecosystems tend to be highly productive, while dry, hot ecosystems or dry and cold ecosystems are less productive. Let's return to the concept that energy transfer between trophic levels is inefficient. When we talk about energy moving between trophic levels, we're talking about moving energy between producers and primary consumers, or between secondary consumers and primary consumers that they eat. The amount of chemical energy in the consumer's food that is converted to the new biomass during a given period is called secondary production of the ecosystem. For example, when a caterpillar eats a leaf, only one-sixth of the potential energy is used for growth of the caterpillar. The rest of the energy is used in cellular respiration and ultimately exits the animal as waste or is lost as heat. Trophic efficiency is the percentage of production that is transferred from one trophic level to the next and is typically between 5 and 20 percent. This is nicely illustrated by this idealized pyramid of energy showing approximate energy transfer between trophic levels. This example uses a 10 percent trophic efficiency other than the first transfer of sunlight to chemical energy in primary producers where we see a 1 percent transfer. This small fraction of energy transfer between trophic levels can have major consequences on the number of organisms that can be supported in each trophic level. We don't find many, many top or apex predators in ecosystems because there isn't sufficient energy at the lower trophic levels to support them. We'll wrap things up in this lecture by covering how biological and geochemical processes cycle nutrients and water through ecosystems. We'll start with the water cycle, shown here on the slide. 
Water is essential to all organisms and its availability influences the rate of ecosystem processes, especially primary production and decomposition in terrestrial ecosystems. The main reservoirs of water are oceans, which contain 97% of the water in the biosphere. The key processes driving the water cycle are evaporation of liquid water by solar energy, condensation of water vapor into clouds, and precipitation. The graphic on the slide shows you how this water cycles between land, reservoirs, atmosphere, and back to land. Let's look at this a different way. All the water on Earth today, every drop, is all the water there has ever been on the planet. Fresh water is actually millions of years old, the same water flowing in a continuous loop, falling as rain and snow from clouds to the Earth's surface, running in rivers, pooling in ponds, flowing from faucets, irrigating crops, traveling through plants, generating power, eventually evaporating into the air and condensing into clouds again. Why is there life on Earth? And the reason there's life on Earth is because Earth has this perfect water cycle. The water cycle, so simple even small children understand the basics. Yet so complex, the most advanced Earth scientists, hydrologists, geologists, and biogeochemists are studying every part and process. The water cycle is fascinating. It's something that's around us all the time, um, and yet we don't really understand it. How to summarize what is known about the water cycle? With two words, flows and stores. The water cycle is a series of flows of water between various water stores or storages. Clouds in the atmosphere. There's always a little bit of water in the atmosphere. We talk about relative humidity. It's a humid day, it's a dry day. Either way, there's water, sometimes a little, sometimes a lot. There's a lot of water in the ocean, 70% of all the water on Earth. In the ice sheets and glaciers, two-thirds of all the fresh water on Earth. In the snowpacks atop mountains like the Sierra Nevada. In the Great Lakes, in rivers and streams, in reservoirs and watersheds, in wetlands in the soil, in and on plants and trees rooted in the soil, and beneath the soil, in water tables and underground aquifers like the Ogallala High Plains, which runs underneath parts of eight states from South Dakota to Texas. All this storage is temporary. Water in all its forms is always in flux and always moving. And there is a name for every kind of movement in the water cycle, starting with precipitation. Precipitation is the process of water falling onto the surface of the earth. You can have precipitation in many forms, rain, snow, hail. Rain is falling water in liquid form. Snow, ice, hail, and sleet are falling water in solid or frozen form. Fog and mist, falling water in gas or vapor form. Precipitation that falls directly onto the oceans becomes part of surface ocean and can be churned by wave and wind action into ocean currents. Rain and snow that falls directly on rivers and streams becomes one part of stream flow. Rain that falls onto land takes a different path to the river, as does the snow and ice that falls and collects on mountaintops when temperatures warm. When snow melts, some of it runs through the snowpack and goes into um, small streams, tributaries that feed into large rivers. What about that precipitation that falls on and over land? Some is intercepted by vegetation, plants and trees. Like you might imagine someone in, in the game of football intercepting a pass, these are raindrops trying to come to the ground and the leaves on the tree intercept them before they hit the ground. And the precipitation that does hit the ground, it can run off if the ground is hardscaped, covered with asphalt or concrete, or if the soil is too wet or saturated to absorb more water, like an over-soaked sponge. Otherwise, precipitation infiltrates the soil surface, percolates into the ground. 
Think of it as, as the water percolating through your coffee grounds in the morning. Gravity continues to pull it downward so it will move through. Through the topsoil, into spaces between soil and rock particles, down to bedrock and further into fractures, into deep underground aquifers. Even groundwater here is moving sideways or laterally, discharging toward a river, lake, or the sea. Generally, the deeper the flow, the slower the flow. Some of that fractured water might take a very long time, thousands to millions of years to get out. And how does water get back out into the atmosphere? It evaporates, is turned from a liquid into a gas or vapor by the heat of the sun. If you put a bit of water into a bowl and you set it outside on a sunny day, it's going to disappear. It's still water, it's just in the form of a gas rather than the form of a liquid. Water evaporates from every wet surface, even from wet air. Some rain and snow evaporates into the air while falling. Water evaporates through our respiration and perspiration, and from plants through transpiration. Trans means through or across. Plant roots drop groundwater. And plants pull that water up through their stems into their leaves and then release it back out through evapotranspiration. Evapotranspiration, a spelling bee worthy term for evaporation from soil and water services plus transpiration from plants. Evaporated water molecules are tiny enough to flow into the air, mixed with smoke and dirt particles in the atmosphere, cool, condense into visible masses of water vapor, clouds. Winds move clouds into colder air, water droplets collide and merge, grow bigger and heavier until they are so heavy they fall again as rain or snow, sleet or hail. Precipitation, collection, runoff, interception, infiltration, percolation, discharge, transpiration, evaporation, condensation. The water cycle. Okay, now that we've looked at the water cycle, let's look at the carbon cycle. Carbon forms the framework for many of the organic molecules that are essential to all organisms. The major reservoirs of carbon are fossil fuels, soils, sediments of aquatic systems, oceans, plants, and animal biomasses, as well as the atmosphere. The main process driving the carbon cycles are photosynthesis, which removes substantial amounts of atmospheric CO2, and similar amounts of CO2 are added back from the opposite of photosynthesis, which is cellular respiration. The burning of fossil fuels and woods also add back CO2 into the atmosphere. Let's use another video to explore the carbon cycle. The air around us is made up of many different gases, including oxygen, carbon dioxide, nitrogen, and inert gases. Oxygen and carbon dioxide in particular are important for the survival of living organisms. The amount of these gases in the atmosphere is maintained by the carbon cycle and the oxygen cycle, respectively. The carbon cycle is the cycle that maintains the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere by continuously taking carbon dioxide from the air and releasing it back into the air. When green plants undergo the process of photosynthesis to make food, they absorb carbon dioxide from the air. The carbon element stored in plants is then transferred to animals that eat the plants. When plants and animals die, their dead bodies decompose and release carbon dioxide back into the air due to the actions of fungi and bacteria in the soil. In addition, all living organisms, including plants and animals, release carbon dioxide into the air through the process of respiration in their entire lifetime. Over a long period of time, the bodies of dead organisms become fossil fuels, which are used by factories power stations, and vehicles. The combustion or burning of fossil fuels 
also releases carbon dioxide into the air. In summary, the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is maintained when photosynthesis, which is a process that requires carbon dioxide, is balanced by decomposition, respiration, and combustion, which are processes that release carbon dioxide. The oxygen cycle, on the other hand, maintains the amount of oxygen in the atmosphere also by continuously taking oxygen from the air and releasing it back into the air. Like the carbon cycle, the processes that require oxygen, such as respiration, combustion, decomposition, and rusting, are balanced by photosynthesis, which releases oxygen back into the air. Many human activities, such as illegal logging and the excessive use of pesticides, interfere with the carbon and oxygen cycles. The consequences of this interference include global warming and the greenhouse effect, which may eventually cause fertile lands to become dry. The ways to reduce the interference with the carbon and oxygen cycles include planting more trees to help reforestation, stopping the burning of fields and forests, preventing the excessive release of smoke from vehicles, avoiding the excessive use of pesticides, banning illegal logging, and making tougher laws to protect the environment. I think this video is an excellent representation, again, of one of the themes that we discussed in previous lectures of this um, overall overlap between science and society and how science can inform a variety of laws as well as various practices within a given society. Now we're going to cover the nitrogen cycle. Nitrogen is part of amino acids, proteins, and nucleic acids, and it often limits primary productivity. Plants can use ammonium, nitrate, and amino acids. Bacteria can also use nitrite, and animals can only use organic forms of all of this. The atmosphere is the main reservoir of nitrogen. Other reservoirs include soils, aquatic sediments, surface and groundwater, as well as biomass. Biotic and abiotic fixation of nitrogen, the nitrification of ammonium to nitrate, and the denitrification of nitrite to nitrogen, as well as human inputs, including agricultural fertilization, crops, and nitrogen gas emissions, all play a role in the nitrogen cycle. And by now, you probably guessed that there will be a video to accompany the nitrogen cycle. Nitrogen as well. cycle. Nitrogen is an essential constituent of all major organic compounds present in living organisms, that is, amino acids, proteins enzymes, nucleotides, and nucleic acids. Different processes that occur during nitrogen cycle are nitrogen fixation, nitrogen assimilation, ammonification, nitrification, and denitrification. Nitrogen is picked up as inorganic compound from the atmosphere and is changed into organic form by plants and some prokaryotes. The atmosphere contains 78% of nitrogen in gaseous state, yet animals cannot use it directly. They can use nitrogen either in inorganic forms as ammonia, nitrites, and nitrates, or in organic form as urea, proteins, and nucleic acids. Nitrogen fixation is the conversion of nitrogen into a compound of nitrogen. Thunderstorm, lightning, and rain helps in transfer of large quantity of nitrogen into soil. Biological nitrogen fixation is carried out by symbiotic bacteria, rhizobium present in the root nodules of leguminous plant like pea. 
Cyanobacteria like Nostoc and Anabena present also fix nitrogen. Some free living bacteria like Clostridium also fix nitrogen in soil. Nitrogen assimilation. Plants take up nitrogen and synthesize compounds from it. Other organisms feed on plants to get nitrogen. Ammonification. It involves the decomposition of proteins of dead plants and animals and nitrogenous wastes like urea, uric acid, etc. of animals to ammonia in the presence of ammonifying bacteria. Nitrification. It involves the oxidation of ammonia to nitrates through nitrites in the presence of nitrifying bacteria, that is, nitrococcus, nitrosomonas, etc. Denitrification. Conversion of nitrate to nitrous oxide and then to molecular nitrogen is carried by denitrifying bacteria, theobacillus. Thus, there is continuous cycling of nitrogen between the atmosphere and living as well as non-living systems. So make sure you understand the various parts of the nitrogen cycle and what key players allow nitrogen to cycle through a ecosystem. Phosphorus is a major constituent of nucleic acids, phospholipids, and our main energy source in mammalian cells, ATP. Phosphate is the most important inorganic form of phosphorus. Reservoirs of phosphorus include sedimentary rock of marine origin, soil, oceans, and organisms. The weathering of rock, leaching into ground and surface water, and incorporation into organic mo molecules, as well as excretion by animals and decomposition, are all important steps and parts of the phosphorus cycle. Welcome to Moo Moo Math and Science and the Phosphorus Cycle. Along with the water cycle, the carbon cycle, the nitrogen cycle, the phosphorus cycle is another biogeochemical cycle that is essential for life on Earth. A biogeochemical cycle is a pathway by which a chemical substance moves through a biotic and the abiotic compartments of Earth. Although phosphorus is not found in the atmosphere, it still plays a very important role in plants and animals on Earth. Phosphorus is essential for plant and animal growth, as well as the health of microbes inhabiting the soil. Phosphorus is very important for the production of DNA and RNA, helps to make up cell membrane, and the production of ATP. The phosphorus cycle is a slow process and involves four key steps. Step 1. Weathering. Phosphorus is found in rocks. Weathering, along with rain, breaks down the phosphorus in rocks and it travels to the soil and into water sources. Step 2 is absorption by plants and animals. Once in the soil, plants, fungi, microorganisms are able to absorb phosphorus and then grow. Some of it also makes its way to the ocean and fresh water, and animals are able to drink this water and absorb the phosphorus. Plants absorb the water along with the phosphorus, and then the animals eat the plants, and the phosphorus moves into the animal in this way also. Three, step three, return to the environment by decomposition. Animals excrete waste, and decomposers are able to use the phosphorus in the waste material. Furthermore, when the plants and animals die, the bacteria convert the organic phosphorus into or inorganic phosphorus in a process called mineralization. And then step four, sediment to rocks. Some of the phosphorus gets buried in sediment, which over time becomes rocks, and the cycle continues. Some of the phosphorus in the soil gets washed to the ocean, where a similar process takes place. Plants and animals in the ocean absorb the phosphorus, die and decompose, and some of the phosphorus ends up as sediments in the rock. Humans have had a significant impact on the phosphorus cycle. 
fertilizers containing phosphorus is added to the soil. This helps the plant grow. However, when the levels of phosphorus are too high, the overabundance of plant nutrients serves and drives excessive growth of algae. When these algae die, they can be toxic to the plants and animals in the ecosystem. If you'd like to know more about the phosphorus cycle, this playlist will help. And as always, thanks for watching. And Moo Moo Math uploads a new math and science video every day. Please. Ecosystems represent dynamic interactions among living organisms and between biotic and abiotic components of the environment. Energy transfer and nutrient cycling are key ecosystem processes. The figure shown on the slide captures many of the topics we've covered thus far in our ecology unit. It uses an Arctic tundra system during the summer to put together the population, community, and ecosystem ecology we have introduced over the past two lectures. From the last lecture, we learned that populations are dynamic. Populations change size through births and deaths, through immigration and emigration. In this image, caribou migrate across, across the tundra to give birth at their calving grounds each year. Snow geese and other species migrate to the Arctic each spring for the abundant food found there in the summer. Birth and death rates influence the density of all populations. Death in the tundra comes from many causes, including predation, shown in the figure by a fox preying upon a snow geese, competition for resources, and a lack of food in winter. Towards the beginning of this lecture, we covered the various ways species interact with each other. In this, in this image, you can see examples of predation, herbivory, mutualism, and competition. Finally, we just learned that organisms transfer energy and matter in ecosystems. On the right side of the image, you see the transfer of energy between primary producers, primary consumers, and secondary consumers. The food chain or food web in the tundra ecosystem is generally quite short because primary production is lower than in other ecosystems. Finally, there are two important chemical cycles shown at the top of this page, the nitrogen cycle and the carbon cycle. Here's the concept map for this lecture one last time. You can use it to review the material and to think about the connections between the topics shown. If you have any questions about this lecture or the ad additional information in your textbook that supports this lecture, feel free to reach out to your professor through email or office hours, or you can bring your questions to class. Also, you can reach out to the learning assistants who are always here to support your learning in Bio 110.